So welcome to the fourth special lecture that's part of the online course. Um, I'm very happy to welcome everyone uh, today. My name is Nathan Nunn, um, and I'll be introducing the three speakers that we have for, uh, for the session today, which will last for an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, so we're very extremely excited to have um, three fantastic uh, speakers that will be participating in the session today. The first is Awa Ambra Sek, who's a PhD candidate in the political economy and government program at Harvard University. Uh, she undertakes uh, fantastic research focused within the fields of economic development and economic history. And so she'll be the first speaker today. The second is Ama Panin. She's an assistant professor at the University of Louvain. Uh, she was previously a postdoctoral researcher at Oxford University prior to taking her current position. And she has a PhD from Technical University of Berlin. So she also does amazing research that's focused in behavioral economics and economic development. So it'll be a slightly different perspective than Awa. And moderating our session uh, uh, today is Kwabena Kra, Kra who's a, and also an economist. He's a postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for Global Development. He has a PhD in uh, economics from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And his research focuses in development economics, but a slightly different angle. In particularly, he, his research focuses in agricultural economics. Okay, so we have three kind of slightly different perspectives, which will talk to us today. Um, and, and Kobena will moderate, so he'll uh, accumulate questions, which uh, you guys can pose through the chat and uh, pose them to Awa and Ama and facilitate a discussion. Okay, so we'll start with Awa will uh, have a short presentation and then Ama, and then we'll turn it over to Kobena who will uh, moderate the, the discussion portion and facilitate questions. So, so we'll start with Awa, please. So hi everyone. My name, as Nathan has just said, is Awa Ambrasek, and uh, I'm a PhD student at Harvard. So today I am going to talk to you about uh, understanding Africa societies or what that means to me. So yesterday lecture um, with Nathan um, was super interesting and you saw a couple of concepts that I want to kind of um, go over quickly before my lecture. So yesterday you, you thought about, your, you talked about how Western societies today are weird in a way, right? So like they're Western, they're educated, they're industrialized, rich and democratic. And most of the academic research is done looking at those societies and then, or it was done, and assuming that it applied to, to everyone else. Western societies are also historically quite homogeneous in that they're kin-based and patrilineal, which is very different from uh, the societies that we find in the African continent that are instead quite heterogeneous still today. The social structure of the West then is just an example of how groups can be organized. And it's not the dominant necessarily, not the dominant form of organization across the world. So yesterday you focused a bit on matrilineal kinship and bride price and how these two practices correlate uh, with uh, important development outcomes today, such as child health. And you also, you concluded the lecture thinking about where you stand matters. So looking at the African continent, looking at African countries and trying to understand it from the perspective of the Western world can be tricky. So this is a bit where I want to start today. So we can think about Western bias in the academic literature in two ways, in my opinion. So first of all, in terms of existence of the literature, in general, the number of economic studies focusing on an African country is substantially lower than the number of economic studies focusing on Europe and the United States. This is, uh, you know, I don't have the exact datum for this, but if you look at ideas, which is a public repository of paper, and you search the keywords Africa, Europe, or United States, you have 75,000 approximately paper for Africa, and then you have 120,000 for Europe and 130,000 for the United States. So a smaller body of literature. And then in terms of um, 
concept and, and setting, I think that is also important in, in a way in which Western bias can manifest itself. Because you look at the African continent and countries uh, from the perspective of a Western country. And so the, find, like, the concepts and findings are interpreted um, often through the lens of Europeans and North it is important, I think, to realize and acknowledge this for several reasons, but two are the following. One is, as a producer of research at the research stage, it is super, extremely important to do qualitative research. Uh, as, and I think it's as important as nailing the quantitative side of your analysis, right? Like the qualitative research will determine your narrative and what you take away from the paper and, and the data you have. And so it is as important as doing a very well-performed analysis. And at the policy design state, you can think that, you know, policies might have different effect when they are applied to societies with different cultural traits, because the, the trait itself will influence uh, the, the effect of policy uh, necessarily. And this is a bit the focus of today lecture. So what is the interaction between policy and culture and how can in a way cultural traits change the effect of policy and vice versa. So how may policy change cultural traits if it can? So on the first part, so how can culture affect policy? We can think about the fact that cultural traits imply, you know, different uh, economic incentives and social structure. You know from yesterday and from your own experience, I'm assuming the social structure of ethnic groups is heterogeneous and it depends on cultural trade and the different practices such as matrilocality, patrilocality, kinship, age set, which is what I'm gonna talk about today, might shape economic and social interaction, which in turn might affect the impact of policies that are implemented since policies often also um, act on economic incentives and interactions. And the second part is that policies can instead uh, affect the persistence of culture, right? You can think in this case that cultural practices regulate people's economic incentives in particular spheres of life. And often you have that one cultural practice regulates several, uh, several spheres of life and has several functions. So if you have a policy that changes those incentives, then this might affect the persistence of the cultural practice. And in a way, it might crowd out the cultural trade, which in turn might have economic effect on other spheres of people's life that are not regulated by the policy, but are not regulated by the trade anymore. And I'm going to briefly talk about this as well, um, if time allows. So what I think would be interesting to do is to look at this work that I, uh, I, I did with Jacob Moscona, which does indeed investigate how the pre-colonial social structure of an ethnic group shapes contemporary and financial distribution today, and how does this affect the effect and impact of policy. We do so in East Africa, and we compare age-based organization, which I'll introduce in a second, and kin-based organization. So what are age-based organization, and, and why am I interested in those? So age-based organization, according to Lowy 1920, are the most important example of an alternative to kinship-based organization. So in these groups, we have the, the primary social group is the age set, uh, which is a group of individuals who are approximately of the same age. They get initiated together, and then they progress through different phases of life together. Elsenstedt 1954 says that the relation between age set age mates involves general and permanent obligations of cooperation, solidarity, and mutual help that closely resemble the family and the kinship. They're prevalent throughout sub-Saharan Africa, and we estimate that over 200 million people are member of societies that used to be organized uh, with age sets or that are still organized with age sets. So I was talking before about Western bias, and here I just want to make a quick note about how uh, it, this is a context that I needed, didn't know to, to begin with. Um, so the way in which this paper was generated was uh, in a class of Nathan, who was talking about HSETs and how, and these horizontal organization, organizations. And that uh, sounded very new to me. So I'm Italo-Senegalese, so West Africa. I know about 
uh, West Africa a bit. I know about Senegal more, but I didn't know about, I had never heard about age sets and kinship was what I knew. And so I started wondering, okay, from my experience, you know, financial distribution is massively important. Uh, when a member of my family has money, that are distributed to other people in the family. But how does this look like in a place, in, in, in a structure that is completely different and so in which you have horizontal ties? So the research, the narrower research question is, do ACED organization have stronger within cohort financial ties? And if so, how does this interact with, within kin redistribution? So redistribution within the family. In other words, I'm just, asking whether in age set societies, people distribute more uh, with people of their own age, so of their own age set, and, and whether this crowds out the distribution within the family. So the first part of the paper analyzes a cash transfer program in Kenya and investigates the hypothesis that age sets shape the structure of the distribution. What we find is that in in, in, in this setting, within cohort spillovers in age set societies are uh, high and uh, an increase when you give the money, which is not true and doesn't happen in kin based societies. And that intergenerational within family spillovers, which we are able to identify uh, looking at the effects of pensions, are, go, uh, are decreased with respect to kin based societies. And then we have a second part in which we evaluate a pension program, a national pension program that was introduced in Uganda in 2011. We thought that was very interesting because pensions program, pension programs are usually thought of as uh, benefiting the whole family. Uh, and, if, uh, in, and if you have stronger distribution within cohort in ancient societies, then this shouldn't happen. And indeed we find that when you introduce a pension in Uganda, Children outcome increase in uh, and children get better in kin-based society. So families are uh, societies organized around extended family, but decrease in um, but but don't increase in age of societies. And so we think then that uh, understanding the social structure and how that interacts with uh, policy is extremely important because for instance, a pension, very expensive social pension program has massively different effects in societies with AIDS and without. Okay, what are AIDS in the data? So I told you before uh, that we, we think about AIDS as people who are of the same cohort and progress through different phases of life together. Uh, but how do we identify it when we have uh, public administrative data? So as I said, our focus is Uganda and Kenya. We have no systematic ethnographic data on AIDS at present. And so what we did is we used the Demographic and Health Survey, which is a survey sponsored by USAID and conducted in several different, in several countries in the world through several years. Uh, we that have questions on um, um, health and the socioeconomic um, outcomes of people, but also information on their language. So we coded 85% of this sample in Uganda and 99% of this sample in Kenya. And we did so looking at ethnographies and consulting um, anthropological studies to understand whether a group and a language was organized with HL or not. And so in our sample, we estimated that 29% of the households in Uganda were ancestrally organized in age set, and 72% of the households in Kenya were organized in age set. And now the question is like, or something you might be asking yourself is, does it matter today, right? Like if this is something that um, is a form of organization of a hundred years ago, maybe it doesn't have any effect today. So besides the fact that we find results, we also looked at data on circumcisions. Oops, sorry. Well, I wanted to show a plot that I can show you. But so basically I can just tell you, uh, tell you real quick. Um, so if you look at data on circumcision, you can see that uh, in age societies, men are usually a circumcised. So this is a, a data that like data that were collected uh, uh, very recently. So in the early to, in the 2010s. So men are usually circumcised together and later in life, which kind of suggests to us that the practice is still uh, conducted because um, 
the initiation often involved circumcision. Okay, in terms of context in Kenya, what we did is to, we looked at the hunger and safety net program, which was a large scale cash transfer program. It was an RCT in Northern Kenya, and we had a baseline survey conducted in 2009 and then follow up surveys in 2010 and 2011. The cash transfers were large. They were 25% of the average income. Um, so in this context, we had houses that were eligible to receive the transfers, transfer and houses that were ineligible to receive the transfer. And then we also had treatment and control group. So what we did is we, we exploited this setting to, to use a difference in difference in difference design. And our main hypothesis was that within cohort ties are strong in age and society. So a higher share of eligible cohort members increases consumption in age and society. So a higher share of people who receives money will increase consumption in age and societies for cohort members, but not in kin-based societies, which just means that the more people in your court who receive the money, the better you will be if you didn't receive the money because they transferred the money to you. And this is one way to look at these effects. So here is the coefficient estimated on the effect of, um, so the effect of share cohort members eligible on consumption of people who are not ineligible. And we have four different sample. The, the white columns are age and societies in the treatment group and in the control group, and the blue columns are um, keen based societies, again, treatment and control. And so what you can see is that in the control group for age and societies and keen based societies both, it doesn't matter how many people in your cohort receive or would have been eligible to receive the money, which is good. And then in treatment groups instead, we have that it does, in age and societies, the higher share of people eligible to receive the money who actually receive the money increases your consumption. But the same is not true in kin based societies. And this is a quite sizable effect in that an increase in one standard deviation in the age cohort treatment increases by 0.3 standard deviation consumption spending. We then looked at the opposite side of the coin. So how does, um, how is across cohorts or within family distribution affected? Looking at the context of Uganda's national pension program. So as I was saying before, pensions are, social pensions are often conceived as a mean of redistributing to a whole family. So this is what the Uganda Ministry of Gender and Labor and Social Development said, talking about the social citizen grant. So they basically were saying, we think about this as a grant that will benefit more than senior citizens in that older people tend to invest a portion of their grant money in meeting their grandchildren's nutritional health and educational needs. And this is what we investigated. So again, using the demographic and health survey from 2016, in which we have measures of household composition, ethnic ethnicity, member age and, and ch children anthropometric outcomes, we looked at the staggered roll out of the pension and we estimated or tried to investigate whether higher household pension exposure increases child health in kin based societies and not in aged societies. So in other words, in kin based society, we expect the grandparents to invest more in their children, but in age society, since the strong the relationship is stronger across cohort members, we wouldn't expect necessarily the money received by a grandparent to spill over to the child. This is what we find. So this again is uh, um, we are plotting the coefficient estimate of the effect of the pension on chi child nutrition. So the dependent variable is weight for height. And we have, again, that the white columns are age set societies and the blue, light blue column are kin based societies. So here we can see that the pension did not have an effect 
in so and we have pilot and non-pilot area sorry I, mean, I should have mentioned that before so some areas received the pension and some areas did not receive the pension and so in non-pilot area you should not expect to see an effect because no one received the money but in pilot areas you should expect to see an effect and we do see it we see that children wait for height increases substantially in societies organized around extended family or kinship and not in aged societies. And this is again sizable because the pension increases child weight for height by roughly 0.15 standard deviations and reduces the likelihood that a child is malnourished by roughly 5.5% in kin-based societies, but it doesn't have an effect in aged societies. So, this said, there is another important insight that we take away from the difference in how uh, these groups are, are organized, like kin-based and age-based groups. So this is a plot that I thought is quite interesting to show because it basically is uh, showing lifetime, the evolution of lifetime consumption. So on the y-axis, we have total consumption and on the x-axis, we have age. And the, the orange dots and line are aged societies and the blue line is non-aged societies. So basically what you can see is that, or what we saw in this plot is that how relying on different redistribution groups will affect the way in which your consumption will, will evolve through time. In particular, if you're mainly redistributing among age mates, you can see how when you're very young and liquidity constrained, um, you might not have enough resources and all you might all be uh, poorer than in kin-based societies where people redistribute with grandparents who might be you know, richer in a way. And then again, when you're old, yes, you might have accumulated income, but at the same time, you might have low, like a uh, a lower amount of people with whom you can redistribute because people die, right? And so you're worse off again. And so different social structure might create different uh, vulnerable groups, which I think is quite important to, to think about. Okay, I have, I'm almost run out of time, but I also want to show you this very quickly, just like a minute. And so I, I hope I gave you insight on how I think uh, culture might change the effect that the policy has. But then there's the other question, which is whether policy can change the persistence of culture. And there's this beautiful paper by, by Natalie Bao that was published a year ago in 2021, in which she looks at whether policy can crowd out culture. She does so uh, exploring the interaction between co-residence pattern, in particular matrilocality and patrilocality, and the introduction of pension programs again. And so in this case, you have that matrilocality and patrilocality have two important effects. On the one hand, they might regulate who will take care of the elderly. And on the other hand, they provide parents with additional incentives to invest in children human capital. And so when you have the introduction of a pension, you have the dispension will, in a way, crowd out culture in terms of regulation of who will take care of the elderly because the elderly will take care of themselves. But then what happens to, to children education? And she basically shows that this is in Ghana, the introduction of pension reduces the practice of patrilocality and matrilocality because there's no need for uh, taking care of the elderly anymore. But then it impacts educational investment of the children who would have been co-residing with the parents. Okay, so it had, um, kind of unforeseen negative impact. So this is also quite important to think about. <clears throat> All right, to conclude, since I'm asked out of time, there's vast differences in social organizations around the world. This we know, we saw it with Nathan, I hope I gave you another insight today. And social structure predictably shapes the patterns of economic interaction and distribution today, which might change the effect of policy and can be, and then culture can be, again, be changed by policy. So we think, I think that understanding the difference in cultural states and social structure is crucial when we think about how to achieve economic development and how to design policy. I have one final personal thought on Western bias which is that people often study what they know and study better what they know. So one simple way, so I was talking before about anthropological studies and study, a certain study 
the context, but a simpler way in a way to increase the number of studies on the African continent and reduce possible misinterpretation of context is to have more African scholars and more Africans contributing to the economic literature and policy making. And so since I thought that my here, perhaps we have a high number of people who are young African students um, or students interested in Africa, I thought of including some resources uh, for who might want to do a PhD in economics. These slides will be posted and hopefully it will be useful to you. Um, thank you, this is all. Great, thanks, Awa. So now we'll hear from Ama. That was fantastic and super insightful, so Ama. Great, so thanks a lot, Awa. That was, it was really great to hear how you position um, research by Africans into the wider way we understand African society. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about some work I've been doing on the Pentecostal church. Um, so this is narrowing in very much on one particular way of understanding African society, and that's through religion and the church. Um, so I'd also take this opportunity to say thank you to everyone who's organized this and thank you to everyone listening. Um, so I'll start off by just showing you two figures that I think shape a lot of my current research agenda. So what we're looking at on the left is a screenshot that came from a large church event in Ghana in about 2017. And essentially what the screenshot is showing is a series of suggested donations to one of the biggest ch churches in Ghana. So for example, to achieve millionaire status, which I am still unclear exactly what that entails, but that would cost about 5,000 US dollars. Um, or the equivalent in Ghana cities of about 20,000. So I'd contrast this with the figure on the right side of my screen, which is a figure coming from the Ghana Living Standards Survey showing the average annual household expenditure in the country. And so what I think is quite striking to me is that the seed of completion, for example, if you want to plant that in the church, that costs about what the average household in Ghana spends on housing in a given year. So as an economist, this is very striking to me. And it sort of shapes the questions that I'm asking in my research in some past papers and in some of my ongoing work. It's basically trying to understand what are they, what are we paying for? Because I am also Ghanaian and I have done my fair number of contributions to the church. So in this talk today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about one paper that I worked on where we were trying to understand if insurance was part of the motivation behind contributions to the church. But before I go into that paper, I'd want to spend a little bit of time telling you why I think it's really important to understand how the Pentecostal slash charismatic churches are growing um, and how that might have an impact on economic outcomes. So one reason I think it's really important is because there's a lot of dynamic, rapid changes in terms of Pentecostal affiliations um, across the world, but in particular in Sub-Saharan Africa. So what we're looking at is a series of graphs that are possibly a bit too noisy, but I'll talk through what's going on here. So each panel here represents proportions of Christians belonging to different Christian denominations. So the denominations represented are Catholics, Independents, Orthodox, Pentecostal Christians, which are highlighted in red, um, other types of Protestant Christianity and people who are affiliated as Christians, but not with a particular movement or denomination. And there are two things I want to highlight with these charts. So the first one is the fact that Pentecostal affiliations are the only ones that are growing globally, so the only Christian movement that's actually increasing the number of people who adhere to it is Pentecostalism. And this is particularly striking in Sub-Saharan Africa. You can also see some of these changes in Latin America and East Asia and the Pacific. But what I think is most interesting in this context is the fact that if we look at many other regions of the world and many other Christian um, movements, there's very little change. So, the second thing I'd want to highlight is under normal circumstances, there's very little switching between religions. But what we are seeing and what we are living through right now is this 
period of quite rapid switching from other religions, but also from other Christian movements towards Pentecostalism. And a lot of this is happening in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so another way of thinking about this is just thinking about, well, which are the congregations across the world that have been growing the most? So here I've um, sort of organized congregations by how rapidly they've grown over the past four decades or so. Um, and I've ranked them from the top to the 10th most rapidly growing congregation. And so what we see in this table is that most of the congregations across the world that are growing are Pentecostal, and most of them are based in Africa. What I find particularly interesting about this table and other ways of looking at the data that are represented in this table is that even the congregations that are in, they are classified as uh, being in Europe or Central Asia. So for example, the redeemed Christian Church of God or the Embassy of God, um, even those congregations, they are in Europe, but they've been founded by Africans. So redeemed Church, Christian Church of God is a Nigerian, Embassy of God is a Nigerian pastor leading a church in Ukraine, which has hundreds of thousands of people and multiple branches across the country. And so I find it very striking that the one Christian movement that is changing and attracting a lot of people has such strong roots in Africa. And we see this even in the sort of exporting of a particular brand of African Christianity across the world. And so to sort of bring it all together, I wanted to share a, a quotation that I love reading out to people, to anyone who wants to listen. And I guess you guys are all my captive audience for the next few minutes. Um, but this is a quotation from a theologian writing in about 2017 and speaking about what has been called the shift of the center of Christianity towards Africa. And so he says, today Christianity is living through a reformation that will prove to be even more basic and more sweeping than the one that shook Europe during the 16th century. That earlier reformation was confined to one small corner of the globe. The current reformation, however, is an earth encircling one. Um, and so this makes my economist ears perk up as well, because there's a large body of work demonstrating how the Protestant reformation in 16th century Europe affected economic outcomes. Um, and so many of these are papers looking at short run, medium run, long term economic outcomes, things like literacy, school enrollment, gender ratios in work and school entrepreneurship. Uh, so there's a large body of evidence suggesting that such significant cultural and religious changes have an effect on economic outcomes. And so from my perspective, this is an amazing moment that we are living through where very particular type of Christianity, which has taken hold in Africa, is sweeping across the continent and sweeping across the world. And so I think it's an interesting moment to try to understand what's going on. And so I'll tell you now a little bit about a paper that I worked on where we were trying to answer that question in a very small way. So this is a moment where I step off my uh, big grand discussions about the new reformation and tell you about our attempts to as cleanly as possible answer one very simple question, which is, is economic uncertainty driving some of the demand for Pentecostalism that we see? And in particular, um, focusing on Ghana um, here. And the reason we start off looking at uh, insurance and uncertainty is because there is a literature from around the world showing how economic uncertainty can drive some of the demand for religion. So some papers looking at this um, using exposure to rainfall risks or exposures to earthquake shocks or even exposure to macroeconomic shocks. What this existing literature mostly focuses on is what I've started terming material insurance. So the idea that if something bad happens to an individual, other church members would contribute in cash and in kind to alleviate some of that material harm. However, within the religious tradition that I'm interested in understanding its economic impact, so within Pentecostalism, there's a very strong teaching focusing on transactional relationships with God. 
And so I use the term transactional here just descriptively and I hope not judgmentally at all, but it's the idea that there's a focus on if you give unto God, God will give unto you. Um, and so this is slightly different from the material channel because this spiritual channel implies people engaging in a set of beliefs that suggest one way to get a spiritual God to act in physical matters is to use money. And so we try to test this experimentally. Um, and what we are trying to look at is if people believe in this sort of transactional relationship with God, when they get access to insurance, does that cause them to give less money unto God, so to speak? But how we measure it is, does it cause them to give less money to their churches and to other spiritual goods that are associated with church teaching? So I'll talk you a bit through the experiment um, and the results. So it's an experiment that we did in, in Ghana and Accra with about 1,000 Ghanaians. They were all recruited from a single denomination, but different branches across the city. And participants were randomly assigned to one of two groups. So in one group, people were enrolled into a life insurance policy. It was called a funeral insurance policy by the company we were working with, but essentially acted as a life insurance policy. So if the individual or one of their family members was to pass away, either that person who was enrolled or other family members would get a payout. So that's the insurance policy that uh, about half of the group was randomly enrolled into. We also had people who were enrolled in a separate treatment which was just to receive information about the insurance product. So they were not insured by our experiment. But what this allowed us to have is two groups of church members from one of the uh, most standard middle of the road Pentecostal churches in Ghana, I would say. We had two groups of the church members, some who had access to an insurance policy because we paid for it for them, we'd enroll them in it, we've gone through the whole administrative process, and a second group who did not have insurance. And they are comparable in all other ways because we had randomly assigned insurance. But what we are interested in understanding is how this changed the relationship of giving money towards the church, but not only the church, giving money towards spiritual goods. So what we examined is how participants would act when they are given the opportunity to either keep money for themselves or to make donations to either their own church, a charity, or an independent prayer event. And so we included the charity and the prayer event as a way of representing the sort of transactions with God, as I tried to explain earlier. Because in this context, money didn't go directly to the participants' own church. And no church members would observe that individual's contribution. Um, rather, this is money that's associated with good teachings. And in a sense, any changes would only be observed by God in the setting. So to get an idea of how we actually collected this um, data, because I, I think it's been interesting to see how many questions are pushing back on understanding exactly where is the data coming from and what what are the concepts being used? So this is a screenshot of how we collected um, data on people's giving. So people were faced with a screen that looked like this and they could press a right arrow if they wanted to increase the amount they give to the church or the left arrow if they want to increase the amount they keep for themselves. And all this was paid out in real money. So at the end of the experiment, we give people an envelope with whatever they kept for themselves and we take an envelope with whatever they gave to their church, to their churches. And so we are interested in how insurance affected what people kept and what people gave away to their church and to the adverse spiritual goods. And so here are the results of what we found in that experiment. So we found that access to insurance did indeed reduce the amount of money people gave to their church and to other spiritual goods. So what we are looking at here in this chart on the y-axis is just a proportion of the amount available that people decided to give away. And what we see is insurance in the lighter blue, people gave less than in the darker blue. But what's particularly interesting is this is an effect that we didn't only observe in giving to the participants own church, which would imply 
the material channel and possibly the spiritual channel as well. But rather we see that people reduced what they gave to also the charity and the external spiritual event. Um, and so what I find quite interesting about this is when I presented the results to some of the pastors who had helped me set up the study and help coordinate things, uh, most of them were not surprised. And so in fact, one pastor sat back and said, yes, of course. Um, and he said, so this is what we teach people. We teach people that if you want God to do something for you, you should give God something in return. And so what our experiment treatment is doing, according to that pastor, is it's creating a situation where people need God to do a bit less for them. And so we'd see the types of results that we expect. Uh, we'd see the type of results that we do see here. We should expect to see those. So I'm going to um, come back to the question that I'd asked at the beginning. Um, after showing you some of these large amounts of money that are going to put hustle churches. So this is part of a larger research agenda trying to understand what people might be paying for. And I've gone over an experiment where we showed how insurance might be one motive. But what I want to emphasize is that this is an experiment that we set up to the best of our ability to identify if there's an effect of insurance. It's not a study that allows us to say that people are only going to church because they want insurance, but rather it allows us to say, it seems as though insurance is one of the motivations and it operates through both the material and a spiritual channel. And I emphasize that because there are a number of other reasons that are important to why people go to the church. So in the surveys that we'd ask people, and in particular people who are switching between um, different Christian churches, we'd ask them, so why have you switched to your current Pentecostal church? The first most popular reason that people gave us is that the teaching about God corresponds to what I believe in. And so perhaps it shouldn't be surprising because it's, uh, that's one of the reasons I imagine that people are going um, to church. And so it's important to keep in mind that we're trying to understand a bundle of goods and services but at its core, I think many people are going to church for the moral and spiritual teaching. But what's equally interesting is one of the second most common um, reasons that was listed is that people prefer to do business with people from their own church. So we got a lot of reports of people saying they use their church as a sort of business network. So people who own small businesses were looking to hire people would first look in their church before looking elsewhere. And people who are seeking jobs would um, look within their church as well in the hopes of being hired. Equally interesting is uh, one of the high ranking reasons that people gave, which is hoping to meet a good marriage partner for themselves or their children. Um, and so this is another aspect of the church that I think was particularly important to highlight given some of the discussions we had yesterday and today thinking about how social structure might affect economic outcomes that we care about. So it seems that one of the important things that Pentecostal churches are doing is providing a setting for different types of um, marriage matches. And so I summarize that the church seems to be attracting overall younger urban people with high aspirations um, and with fewer ties to traditional support networks. So this is not data I'm showing, but it's data that does exist and which is consistent with the types of reasons or the multiple types of reasons that people tell us that they are switching to Pentecostal churches and why they find those affiliations particularly important. And so I think the interesting question that this all raises for me is thinking more deeply and more broadly about not just the fact that people gave money to the church, which is clear and which I think most people who uh, live in an African setting might have a sense of, but rather thinking about what the unique bundle of beliefs and networks and services are that the Pentecostal churches are offering and that make them so successful. And part of the reason I think it's really important to pose this question when we think about ways of trying to understand African societies are for all the reasons I gave before, 
And I'll end with a chart that I think highlights these reasons and summarizes them. And so this is a chart where I was trying to get a sense of, well, we see a lot of money going to the church. Uh, we see it and like if you drive around a car, you'd see the best real estate is taken up by the churches. I've spoken to uh, bankers who tell me how much of their balance sheet is taken up with church loans and, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of evidence that people are actually paying for millionaire status and so on. Um, and here in this chart, I was trying to get a sense of, well, how much might this be overall? Because we don't have a clear, nicely audited trail of church contributions. And so what I'm presenting here is just very rough back of the envelope calculations. Um, so if a third of Pentecostals or a third of people who say they are strongly affiliated with the Pentecostal church pay their tithes, which is 10% of their income, how much would that be as a percentage of GDP? And then I try to benchmark that to, well, what are the governments actually raising in income revenue? So what we see on the y-axis is revenue raised from income taxes as a percentage of GDP. So it's about 12% in South Africa and a bit less than 12% in Namibia. And then overlaid on those columns is sort of this very conservative estimate of, well, what might the churches actually be raising if even a tiny fraction of church members are giving the amounts of money that they claim they are giving. And it's really striking that this is a lot of money. Um, in some countries, it's even more money that might be going to Pentecostal churches than going to the governments. Um, and so I just end with the statement that I think half the time, it's not clear when we pay income taxes to governments across the continent what they are using the money for. But I think it's equally interesting and important to try to think about, well, where's the money going with alternative institutions? So thank you for that. And I look forward to the discussion. Great, thanks. Thanks, Alma, that was fantastic. And I think a lot of people are extremely interested in that. Uh, so we'll hear from Kobena who will facilitate and uh, moderate the, the question answer portion. Thank you both. Uh, that's really, really interesting, I think. Uh, those are a bit uh, disconnected. So I try to <laughs> uh, put the questions in such a way that the ones that I can link, I will link, but the ones that are uh, um, specific, I will just go to the specific person that presented. So, and in order to be fair, I, I wouldn't want to spend all the time on one person. I will you know, ask one or two questions to our first and then I will come back to Ama and then if time allows, I'll go back to Ama. I hope that's it, it's fine, right? Is that okay with you, Awa and uh, Ama? Okay, that's great. So, um, Awa, I think the the question that keep kept you know um, coming up while you were uh, presenting is if you could actually throw more light on age sets and you know uh, kinship, if you can actually draw you know the, the 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 distinction or tell us what exactly these are because a lot of questions were in that line. Yes. Okay. So I, I also saw some of the questions. So this is this is really good. Um, yeah. So I think there's like two main things that if I'm understanding people want to know. One is like, what is the dif like what is the difference between ages and kinship? Like what is the definition? And then like, can we draw a line between the two? Like, are they coexisting sometimes? And so in terms of like definition, uh, I will just say that we in the paper, we, we consider the age set groups as groups that are predominantly organized around the age set. And we do understand that you might have some form of kinship organization as well. So we think about age set societies as groups in which you have um, this group of men often in East Africa. In West Africa, you also have a you know, group of women um, in which men are initiated together. They go through different spaces of life together, often political life. And so they create this very strong bond and they have, uh, you know, they, they have ob like obligations of a distribution among each other, which we think 
uh, is important in terms of money distribution, which is why we study that. And then when we think about kinship groups, we think more about extended family. And so, you know, uh, parents, grandparents, not only the nuclear family, so just like, uh, you know, children, parents, but grandparents and, and cousins as well. Um, and yeah, it is correct that like you have, uh, you have um, these two structures, these two concepts coexisting sometimes. You do have some stark, um, some stark distinctions at times, like the Maasai are a very strong age of society in which, you know, uh, some Maasai in ancient times at least didn't even know the name of their grandparents. I'm, I'm wall of the wall of don't have age sets. I, I had never heard of them. So you have like these distinct societies. And like when there was something in between in terms of our paper, what we did was trying to understand which is the predominant form of organization. And so this is the proxy we used. We understand it's not perfect, but um, we did use circumcision data to validate our, our um, distinction. Because as I was mentioning briefly before, the rite of passage often in, in, includes a circumcision ritual. And so in age societies, when you look at the age of circumcision of men, if they're circumcised, uh, you would expect that to be uh, at adolescence, so like later in life, so not when they're just born, but like 14, 15, puberty, and then um, for it to be like for the date to be closer, you know, because they're doing it together. And we do see that given our categorization, which kind of made us confident that uh, it's done in the most appropriate way, or like the best we could do at least. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, Mayna's accent, age sect and kinship can and does intersect, right? How did you, yeah. you know, overcome this? Yeah. So that yeah, so that's what I was what I was uh, mentioning. So they do intersect. Uh at times it's very it was very so we had a, a list of languages and ethnographies from the DHS. This is how we created the HS article. And so what we did was um, we read a lot of uh, ethnographies and we tried to understand whether HS was the predominant form of organization despite that kinship existed, despite of the fact that kinship existed. If it, it didn't seem like it was, then we thought that it was a kinship society. Does it help? Wonderful. It's yes. not perfect, but it it, it seems to it's, be. I think that's uh, <laughs> Mayna will be happy. I I, I believe because it's uh, um. So should I add this? This seems like a general question, but okay. Let me throw this in as well before I come back to Ama. Uh, so does African culture? Our our in you. I will start with you. Does African culture impede the effectiveness of policy? You know, implementation in general. Yeah. No, I wouldn't say that at all. Um, so does African culture impede the effectiveness of policy? No, not at all. What I think is that it's very important for policy to take into consideration the culture of the place in which the policy is implemented for it to be as effective as it could be. So the it's not African culture that impedes anything. African culture is there, it's been there for thousands of years. It's policy that has to take that into consideration from my point of view. Wonderful. Thank you, Awa. I will come back to you definitely. Uh, let's go to Ama so that she can also tackle one or two questions. Ama, I will start with you. What uh, is the contribution of the church that's Lucy asking this towards economic development of Africa? Oof. So, as I mentioned, this is like asking one part of this question is part of my research agenda, and I think I'd have to have a hundred lives over to answer it completely. Yes. So I think it's difficult to give one straight answer, but there, there are a couple of things that we can point to. So one thing that I think is interesting is to think about the role um, Protestant churches played during the turn towards independence in the 90s. So that's a well-documented literature on the role of Protestant and Catholic church in um, democratization. So there's this element of the churches helping civil society leading to democratization. Um, there's also elements that I was trying to get at in my 
study and it, with some of my overview of the church being a source of alternative services to people. Uh, so I looked at insurance as one thing, but we see a lot of provision of things like healthcare through religious organizations. And so there's a sense that religious organizations might act as alternatives to states where they are weak state institutions. Um, so that might be a second place to look for impacts. Um, and I think I could sort of go on in this catalog, yeah. like jumping from politics to economics. Um, but in general, what I'd say is it's quite complicated and I think very context dependent. Um, and so I'd leave it there for now. All right. Nathaniel is asking, do you personally believe that uh, religion is a major part of African's economic problems? I think similar to what Awa had said um, in response to the question about is culture <laughs> preventing development. Um, I don't think religion per se is a hindrance to Africa's development. I think the particular forms of religion that people practice and that people are drawn to in the African continent exist for a reason. I think it's important as researchers for us to find out why, and then to start to think about how can those reasons be harnessed in designing better policies and also as citizens in designing better societies. Wonderful. And the last one, Ajo is really, really curious. Say so how you know disturbing was it for you as a young economist and seeing the donations, you know, those donations that you showed um, and the donations to the church and uh, the, the per capita expenditure, you know, per year of, of an average, you know, Ghanaian household. How, to what extent, can you explain further or can you talk more you know, about that? Were you really disturbed about that? And if so, you know, to what extent were you actually disturbed looking at the donations that was going to the church and uh, looking at how much the average household was spending in a year. So I'd say the figures are striking, but then I'd also um, point back to one of the early conversations I'd had with one of my PhD supervisors when I said, people are giving all this money to the church and I think we need to do something about it. And she pointed out that, well, people spend money on all sorts of things that we don't understand. So um, it's not necessarily that it's bad. It's rather that there's something that we should try to explain and try to understand. So I find the numbers quite striking, um, but in the time that I've spent talking to people about what they're doing in church, gathering some more data, uh, some work with like the experiment that I talked to you about, I think there is a sense that people are purchasing something. Whether the price is right, I don't know, but I think there's a sense that people are getting something of value Wonderful. Um, well, this question, I believe, is a general question, so I'll pose it to the two of you. Um, is the economic strength of a country not a greater factor than ethnicity? Want to take it? Uh, I, I could give an answer and then pass it okay. on uh, to our end. And I suppose, again, here, I'm, I wouldn't be able to give a clear answer about whether economic strength matters more than ethnicity, um, because people's ethnic identities are as much part of the, uh, the way they interact with the world around them and the way they interact with economic opportunities. Um, it's part of them as much as their identity as a worker or an employer or anything else that we might think. So. I wouldn't be able to make a clear distinction between the two rather than to say, as, as I've said <laughs> repeatedly, I think it's important to understand what role ethnicity plays because that helps us understand how we can harness that part of identity for economic development. Awa? Yeah, no, I think you made a, a you know an excellent point. I don't have much to add. I think. I completely agree with you. Uh, it's hard for me to think about economic development without thinking about culture and vice versa, because the two are, I think, uh, 
profoundly related. Um, so yeah, I mean, one thing might be that, I mean, as I was saying, like if we really, if the goal is to achieve development, achieve growth, uh, make people better off, I think understanding ethnic identity might really help as well as, you know, religiosity, like how does culture play a role in development and how can we leverage cultural aspects in a way to achieve development? I think that is important, but I don't see them in competition or rather in collaboration if anything. I don't know, hopefully. Wonderful. Yeah. All right, Amma, there's another question here for you. I don't want to miss this. Somebody's asking about your methodology. Can you really subject a Christian to an RCT? Because he believes that you know, giving is a universal mindset, and everybody gives. Oh uh, well, so I think my first easy answer would be: I think you could submit anyone to an RCT in a sense, um, you know, conditioned on it being ethical and so on. But I, I, I guess the sense here might be for me to try to explain what I think is going on in our experiment. So I think. I, I would think of it as people had access to insurance and then they had the opportunity to give money to their churches. And then we interpret whether access to insurance changed the amount of money that people gave to their churches. Um, that, those are the facts. You know, we randomly had insurance, people gave money to their churches. Perhaps there's a question about how we interpret those facts. Um, and so I tried to discuss why we interpret our particular setup as finding for some sort of spiritual beliefs. Um, but I do fully accept that some people might think that the types of beliefs that we think we are measuring are not properly captured in our setting. Um, I'd be interested in having that discussion, but in terms of just having an experiment where pe some people got access to a particular secular product and then it changed the way they gave money to their church. I think that aspect of the randomization and the outcomes, that is as it is. And then it might be a question of interpretation beyond that. Wonderful. The last one, and then I will probably go back to our. Does the operation of the Pentecostal churches in Africa, you know, differ from your counterparts in Europe? And if so, why is no such such a difference? Yeah, so I think that's also a really interesting question. And um, and I won't go too far because then I'll overstep my economics knowledge into you know what theologians have been thinking about this much more than I have in a much deeper level. No, but some of the things that I think might be um, different at a faith value is the fact that. Firstly, we see the African Pentecostal church just being much more dynamic and attracting many more people. So part of the reason I showed that table about the most dynamic congregations and had highlighted that those come from African churches is to highlight the fact that one thing the African Pentecostal church seems to be doing better, quote unquote, than other churches is simply being attractive to people. And if we think that people are going to church out of their own free will. That's something that's quite interesting to see that they are certainly doing something different and also doing something different in various parts um, of the world. In terms of specific theologies, as I said, uh, I wouldn't go into that. Uh, but the final thing I'd say is because the African Pentecostal church plays such a larger role in society than Pentecostal or charismatic churches elsewhere, I think the the impacts of this sort of teaching and thinking are probably larger in societies where there are just many more people who subscribe to these sorts of beliefs. Wonderful. Awa, there is a, a piece here for you from Young. Young is asking if there is any known relationship between culture and policies in Europe and, and Western countries. Any non relationship? if there is any known relationship between culture and policies in Europe and, and that of the you know Western countries. And if you right. could maybe highlight a few, one or two, if there, there is any. 
Okay, so this is a this is a good question. So what if trying to rephrase it, um, what they would like to know is whether we know about in Europe how culture and policy intertwine in a way, and like if we know anything about this relationship. Okay, I'll try. I don't know. I'll try to understand using using um, what I know. So I don't. Uh, I don't know of a paper that explores the relationship between cultural traits and policy in in Europe, uh, or I can't think about it right now. But I will think, and if someone else knows, please let me know. But I, I will think. I will think about it. Um, but something though that um, that I was thinking about is like when I was talking about pension programs, right? Pension programs are. Um, where when we think about pension programs spilling over to other members of the family, we are, have in mind uh, uh, a society based on nuclear family and then grandparents around it, which is Western in a way. I don't know if it's, if it's, if it's a good response, but, and in general, well, the other thing that I would say is that when we think about policies as like cash transfer and redistribution, we think about redistribution in terms of uh, family and village usually, and we don't, take into consideration other forms of redistribution that might happen, such as like castes in India or, you know, Asia in Africa and, um, and things like that. And so in this sense, I do think at least like in the research allowed cash transfers, we kind of have this Western bias, so to speak. But uh, I don't know if this was exactly the question. It was a hard question for me. I think it's fine. Uh, it's, it's good. Uh, Chica is asking, is curious, you know, whether uh, He's right in thinking that age sets is generally for males. Yeah, rather than that is females. That is does right. Differ, I got, does it vary by 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 different cultures? And if true, why is this the case? Yeah, I didn't have to, I didn't have the time to go through this, but our and I got a few questions about it, so I should have probably, but like our uh, results are driven by male respondents. And it's true that in East Africa in particular, we have that age that mainly involve men, uh, which makes, I think, you know, the study of how they interact with gender relation, like uh, relationship, for instance, quite interesting, I think. There are though age sets that involve women. I know of secret societies in uh, Liberia that are women based mainly. And uh, in and someone just texted, uh, wrote in the Q and A before that they know about West African um, age sets uh, that involve women. And I think it's very very fascinating to understand the gender component about age set. In our setting, though, it's mainly men, and the results are indeed driven by men. Okay, wonderful. Uh, a few more questions from here. Um, I will definitely come back to you. Okay, now let me let me go back to our this question. I think the person asked it like multiple times. So, well, it's really interesting that you know you set up this work to do in Uganda and Kenya, and he believes that you know why is it that Nigeria has this you know huge population with diverse people, but this kind of research like the one that you're doing wasn't really uh, doesn't consider Nigeria why what are some of the challenges or reasons why such a country with a huge population would be considered in that regard yeah that is also a good question I think that is sometimes you have to make a choice in which countries so either you do a cross-country you know a, a, a study that involves you know several countries like many countries and then you have to include you know for instance all the sub-saharan african countries or you make a call on which countries to study and we picked kenya and uganda because um they were a good setting they have both ages and kinship and then um data availability was very good and also we had the policy the policy implementation that allows us to conduct the study it's true that like Nigeria might have been a good uh, a good other option in the sense that it's extremely heterogeneous. They have a very high number of ethnic groups, uh, different languages. It's a very interesting uh, context to study, and it's very big. 
but it wasn't fit for for our study in particular because of data remediation. One thing I would say is that I think there's excellent one the work done in Nigeria. Uh, Belinda Archibong we present to here in this series. She does awesome work. And I think there's going to be a country focus next week, I think, on Nigeria and South Africa. So Nigeria is coming. Nigeria is coming. So just like this. Wonderful. I think our time is almost up, but Emma will give you this one last you know, question and then we'll probably close it from there. So in your work, did you actually uh, explore further to find out whether people that actually you know, give this donation, they get what they expect in return. For instance, somebody believes he gets, you know, uh, his marriage, his or her marriage is good because, you know, he gave a seed, he sold a seed to a church. And so he or she got that wonderful marriage or got some beautiful thing because of, you know, the, the, the donation that they gave. So is this a question about how people verify the outcomes of yeah, the like, did you do, do you, you know, have uh, knowledge about that? You know, people think, do people really think they, they get what, you know, they, they expect because I give donation because I'm actually uh, wanting to get a thousand folds of whatever I'm giving out. So um, I don't have any data on if people okay. directly okay. get the things they, request, but I think the fact that people keep going back to the churches is yeah, one yeah. sign that either they keep looking or they haven't been disappointed enough yet. Um, and then the final thing I want to say on this point is what I find particularly interesting about the Pentecostal churches and why it ended with this line about a bundle of beliefs and networks and services is part of what the churches do is they give people a set of beliefs, like you will get married within the year, but the church also spends a lot of effort into organizing young singles mixers and into having the choir be mixed gender. So I think some of what I'm working on now is thinking about the way the church offers promises, but also puts in a lot of material facilitation sure to give happens. people the opportunity to meet those promises. So that might be one way to address whether people get what they hope for. All right, thank you so much. I think it's time we have about 200 more questions so we can actually not talk about every ask every question on the platform but the beautiful thing is that these questions are going to be answered so if you go back to where they will be uploading uh, these slides uh, and these uh, recorded versions you would have uh, all these questions being answered there thank you so much such a, a wonderful talk by the two of you Great. Thanks so much, Kobena. That was a fantastic job moderating and uh, synthesizing and distilling 500 questions down to seven, which is not an easy job at all. So, And, and thanks so much to Awa and uh, Ama for fantastic uh, presentations. So just judging from the comments we received and the questions, uh, everyone finds this extremely fascinating. They have lots of opinions on the topics. I think uh, religion and culture are things that uh, people have ha have opinions about, and then also how they are affected by and affect economic development is also something uh, that people have questions and comments about. And I think we really uh, need to continue to understand. Um, so just uh, before closing, I just want to flag that tomorrow uh, there will be a special uh, event or a special class, if you want. I uh, think of it that way. Uh, and I will be um, interviewing or having a discussion with uh, Leonard Wanchikan. And he'll be talking about lots of the issues that have been raised. Uh, for example, um, thinking about research on the African continent by individuals who are located in Africa or born in Africa. He'll, he'll tell uh, or we'll discuss a little bit about his, his own story. Um, so he has a very interesting background, very interesting path and then his efforts now to uh, promote research uh, within, within the continent. Um, and then after that Friday, there'll be a review session and that's listed here. So you can see that on the screen. And then next week uh, I will have uh, one session which I'll talk about the slave trades and whether the slave trades within the continent, so the enslavement of individuals and the exporting of these individuals to outside of the continent 
uh, what effect that had at the time, and then what that effect that had on long-run economic development. Okay. Um, and then on the Wednesday, we'll have uh, Patrick Manning and Ugo Nokeji will provide presentations. And so this, this should be interesting. And so we're out of time, so I'll just say goodbye to everyone. Thanks so much for, for joining. And thanks again to, to the uh, presenters, Ama, Awa, and Fabena. And we'll see everyone hopefully tomorrow with uh, Leonard Wachikon. So thank you so much. Thank you.